Shut up and sit down. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Bowhunter Chronicles podcast brought to you by Tacticam. Tacticam is by far the easiest way to begin filming your hunts. Whether it's the budget-friendly solo or the 4K Tacticam 5.0, Tacticam has something for everyone. They also have the Reveal Cell Cam. Uh, the cell cams are quickly becoming one of the most difficult cameras to find uh, with their excellent quality at an incredible price point. Uh, so check that out at Tacticam.com. This week we are joined by... Dirk Durham, the Bugler, host of the Bugler broadcast podcast. He's also one of the main guys with the Elk Collective, as well as uh, he works for Phelps Game Calls. So if you're ordering any of those last minute elk calls for this season or any turkey calls for next season, uh, when you call up, you might just get Dirk on the phone. So um, Dirk is hilarious. Uh, we have a lot of fun with this one, but he's also a world champion elk caller, uh, world class guy, world class elk hunter. Um, and we actually have some technical difficulty in the middle of this episode, and I left it in just because it's hilarious how it all kind of plays out. But we go through um, elk strategy, elk calling, uh, lots of different things for uh, beginning elk hunter. So it's a it's a great episode um real quick i just want to say thank you to our patreons got a new patreon casey kurth out of minnesota uh thank you for signing up for the patreon program and uh you know supporting us patreon is crowdfunding for creators uh so he gives us uh it's it'll be a donation every month and um you know we we really couldn't be doing everything that we're doing for that uh without for the podcast without the patrons and uh, we really do appreciate that and to to give back we uh do some giveaways uh for the patrons uh, i've got a set of b sticks we're giving away one of the tactic Game 5.0s we have uh yearly uh subscription to base map pro and uh, if you're not using base map, you should definitely check it out. The free version is pretty good, but the pro is um, everything that any of the other uh, online mapping apps is, um, but with more layers, tons more options, uh, unlimited downloadability, uh, whatever your phone can hold, you can download a map that's as big as you want it. So, you know, base map can do that for you. So definitely check that out if you go online uh, to app.basemap.com uh, you can use the code chronicles for 20 percent off of that and so it's 24 dollars for the entire year um, you know which is this the same as one state for some of the other ones so definitely something to check out but uh, we've got a bunch of giveaways through that um, just sent out is is merch package so you'll get some koozies and some of those uncle frank stickers uh it seems to be that there's a clamoring for some jeep stickers with the uh with the arrow in it i'm sure john will really appreciate that uh maybe i'll have to get that made into a shirt um but anyways uh, i just want to thank you know casey and all the other patreons that uh support us on the show um if you want to show us a, a little bit of support throw us a couple dollars every month uh you can certainly do that by going to patreon.com forward slash bowhunter chronicles podcast and uh you know you get access to our uh, facebook page as well as uh, some of the other things that we do behind the scenes and um really appreciate all those patreons but this episode is super fun and there's no saddle hunting talk so it's uh it, it should be refreshing for, for many of you, so uh, just thought I'd put that out there. But you're going to enjoy this episode. Uh, fun for me to edit, so it's definitely going to be fun for you to listen to. Thanks for listening. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Bow Hunter Chronicles podcast. Uh, John, Frank... And uh, myself here, uh, sitting in the studio, actually uh, recording a podcast, and we've got uh, a guest on the line, and I don't know if you guys know, but uh, he is a pretty big deal. Um, he is Dirk Durham, the Bugler. He is the host of the Bugler Broadcast 
podcast. And if you haven't listened to it, I think you should. And you've got to give it some time because it starts out a little slow, but I think what they say is it it, it escalates pretty quickly. Um, what would you say to that, Dirk? And how are you doing this evening? <laughs> you get to kind of out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hey there. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, part of your podcast is you've got a call in line. And um, I think one of our Patreons actually called in and actually got through. Um, and it was a pretty memorable call. I think he was pretty hard on you. It was, um, his name's Doug. And uh, he's he's an elk hunter. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he prides himself on his calling. I don't know if you want to go through that call uh at all or like the format of your show <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I think he refers to himself as Doug damn Flutie uh, <laughs> he's an old redneck boy uh, <laughs> loves he loves the elk flute it's a, the Terminator 2 and uh, you know he he's not afraid to mix it up <laughs> he's the one who doesn't believe in the uh, scent checker bottles doesn't he use like the marble reds or something like marble that? reds yeah, <laughs> yeah. well no oh, well, he called in and said he's been using palm oil. oh yeah that's right <laughs> palm oil 100s palm oil red 100s <laughs> so he gets a little longer uh use out of them uh, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome i actually i actually got in contact with him afterwards and uh do you, do you remember uh did you watch my mouth tab madness series last last year on uh on YouTube. Yeah, we caught a little bit of that. Yep. Yeah, so uh, my camera guy, Doug, or not Doug, my <laughs> camera guy, <laughs> Dusty, Dusty actually sat down with him and interviewed Doug Flutie here. Um, and uh, I don't know if he's put the film together yet, but uh, yeah, Doug, he's he's quite a guy. Let me tell you what. Yeah. <laughs> uh. But uh, all kidding aside, Dirk, uh, can you give us a little bit of an introduction for the guys who aren't familiar with you? Yeah, my name is Dirk Durham, a.k.a. The Bugler. I've uh, been elk hunting for 30 years. Um, just love calling in elk. And, and uh, you know, to me, calling one in and fooling it and getting one to come in real close and having him commit, whether we get a shot or not, um, that's what it's all about to me is just calling him in and and yeah, I want to kill one bad. And, and my hunting partners I've had over the years, they want to kill one bad too. But, but man, if we can fool them, get them to come right in, uh, into archery range or darn near to it. Um, that's, that's a, that's a job well done, I think. So, you know, that's what I live for. Um, it's kind of my why. That's what I, I, I do everything for. So my wife kind of rolled her eyes at me a lot because, you know, it's all, I'm I'm kind of a shallow person. I I mean I can talk about all cunning. I can't talk sports. I, and I'll talk politics sometimes, depending on who I'm around, <laughs> which side of the table they're on. <laughs> but right. uh, yeah, I'm I'm all about elk hunting, man, with a boat. And I'll and I'll pick up a rifle if I can, you know. And I'm an opportunist. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not a, a an elitist bow hunter. I mean, I'm I'm an opportunist if I can be hunting elk with a bow that's my that's what i prefer but uh, if i can rifle hunting uh, for elk i love it and, and whitetail hunting with with a rifle and i love it so um yeah well since you mentioned whitetail and you know it's going to be uh frank's first uh, and i mean it's not like john and i are expert elk hunters by any <laughs> means but no. we've done it before so i mean you know there's there's points there right but so, you know, Frank and his hunting partner is going to be their first time in the elk woods. And then, uh, you know, one of we've got some questions from listeners and stuff. And we told them that we were going to have you on here. Actually, you know, we always ask, like, who do you want on uh, as uh, guests or, you know, topics or whatever? And they said, you know, we want to hear from a professional elk hunter. And so I was like, well, the, you know, I reached out to you and. You said, sure. And I thought, man, he's got to be kidding or something. He's never heard the show. Um, <laughs> but um, so but I know you called Doug Flutie first. Even <laughs> phone calls. Uh, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> you know, he didn't get back with us. He was doing some sort of photo shoot. And I think we got <laughs> got to the bottom of that one. Um, but uh, so the, one of the questions that we had on that was like, what can we transfer from the whitetail woods into elk hunting? I mean, 
as different as they are, where can we see some parallels? Um, so I'd like to say the opposite world, like uh, Superman and Bizarro World. I don't know if you guys are old enough to watch the Superman cartoons <laughs> when you were a kid. And Bizarro World for Superman, everything was ass backwards, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say, you know, if you're going to be hunting whitetails with a rifle, to me, that's a very slow, methodical process. You know, I'm not moving quickly through the forest. I'm moving very slow. I want to move slow enough to where I see the deer before they see me, right? And uh, and that's almost sometimes rifle hunting elk at the certain at certain points of during the hunt. But uh, to me, elk hunting with a bow is a hundred percent opposite of that. I'm not too worried about um, being quiet. I'm not too worried about moving slow and stealthy. Um, I want to I want to make a lot of noise. I want to crash around i want to move quickly and aggressively to the spot and get set up um so um so it's not really like whitetail hunting in that regard it's actually opposite and i think i think a lot of guys that come out will be they play the safe game and i i'd hardly ever play that safe game i'll hold my cards you know tight sometimes and, and maybe slow play things a little bit until i feel like okay the time is right now i it's time to get aggressive but um, that's quite a bit different. Um, whitetails, you know, whitetails, people follow rub lines. Uh, people follow scrape lines, you know, and they set up. And, you know, you start, you get a good rub line on a whitetail buck. Um, you probably you put your tree stand on it, or if you want to still hunt that country a lot, you know, you're probably going to see that buck again or a, a different buck that's going to be traveling that same corridor uh, or checking those scrapes. Whereas elk, they don't really revisit those those rubs too too often. A lot of times, that's just that's kind of an in the moment thing. As they travel through their day and they get frustrated or want to show their dominance or mark up a tree or or just they're bored and got all this testosterone flowing, they just make up a random rub. Now, what it, what I will say though about rubs is, you'll if you're if you're hunting an area and you're just not finding rubs and you're not getting any bugles and then it's weird like overnight bang you'll start seeing rubs pop up and then you'll start hearing bugles um when i start seeing rubs especially like if you're hunting rodent country if you're not in the back country the roadless stuff if you're hunting rodent country and all of a sudden you start seeing rubs popping up on along the road it's like okay bulls are starting to cruise now they're starting to cruise start looking for for cows, you know, uh, maybe find a harem of their own to, to, to fight for. And uh, it, usually that, that kind of gives me a little bit of confidence to be like, all right, um, this area here, you know, pretty big general area, it's going to have some bulls that will probably bugle. Now, I'm not going to camp on that rub. I'm not going to camp on, you know, let's say it's a crossing or something there. I'm not going to camp on that rub thinking that bull's probably going to come back like a white tail might. He's he's not going to do it. He, chances are, I mean, maybe, but a lot of times they're just, there's covered country. They're rubbing their, their antlers or horns, whatever you want to call them. I like to call them horns most of the time, but, uh, but yeah, that, that's a, that's a, something they do both do, but they don't, they, there's a, dra- a big difference in, in how they, in how they kind of live in their life cycle there. Um, White, man, whitetail hunting to me and, and elk hunting, they're, they're a lot, they're polar opposites. Um, turkey hunting, a lot of people say turkey hunting is just like elk hunting. It's, it's similar, whereas, you know, you can kind of do the run and gun thing for turkeys and, and find, find toms that'll want to, want to go. And I, and I feel like that's a pretty good similarity. They, I think elk and turkeys have more in common than, than elk and whitetail deer. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, for us, that was one of the first things when we, you know, we, we had met up with uh, some people and they were really helpful to us. They was, And that's what they said straight away is like, you're not whitetail hunting. They don't care if you're making noise, if you're breaking sticks and they're, you know, they cover ground. So you need to get out there and get after them. You know, don't worry about them. That's not what's, you know, your scent is going to 
be more of a deterrent than your movement, your noise, any of that stuff. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and you had mentioned like setting up or camping out, you know, th- there was a question about using, you know, tree stands or blinds or anything, setting up on that, um, you know, getting from one of the, the listeners. So yeah, where, where does that fall in? Um, you can definitely, um, use tree stands and blinds to your advantage for elk. Um, let's say you have a, a ridge line and you have two basins and they connect. Let's say one side's got a lot of feet in it and the other side's got a lot of timber in it. And elk, a lot of times will follow the path of least resistance. So there'll be a saddle or something, you know, putting your tree stand in a saddle or near the saddle. Uh, that's a great place to uh, ambush a bull or a cow, whatever you're hunting for. Um, you can post up on wallows. If you're in dry country, you know, um, a lot of the Northwest and even, you know, Montana, Wyoming, there's a, quite a bit of water, really, um, in a lot of the country. So setting up on water, unless it's super dry and there's just like no water around, you'll, and you'll be able to tell, be like, if you're seeing a lot of creeks, posting up on a certain water hole may not pan out for you but if if you're just not seeing any water anywhere and you kind of find some water and there's elk tracks there that might be a great place to set up and and have a and have a tree stand and, and capitalize on that or a blind um but uh yeah it's the, the trouble though in some of these states that have wolves um one week the elk will be there the next week they're long gone uh, so, you know, if you, if you base your, your tree, your hunt on, well, I'm going to hunt these two or three drainages and I got my stand set, you, you could possibly get there and find fresh elk sign, but sit in a tree and rotate through your stands for the next 10 days and never see an elk or see another piece of fresh sign just because, you know, maybe the, the wolves have pushed them out of there or, you know, maybe you're hunting Colorado or something where there's just a ton of people. And uh, maybe the you know there's enough hunting pressure that it kind of blew them out of there. So how f- um, how far will they uh, will they go? You know, um, like, depending, like yeah. you know, in Colorado, sometimes you know I have only hunted there once, but you, you talk to a lot of guys in Colorado and say you know you kind of got to play your cards tight because a lot of times if you blow blow them out of a basin, you know they're gonna go up over the top of the mountain into the next over to the next side and it may be two or three miles, four miles away wow. um, in a direction. Maybe you don't even know which way they go. And, and uh, you know, a lot of those States, you know, they'll, they'll relocate a couple, a couple, three miles pretty easily. Um, so, and Roosevelt's, which I've never hunted, but you know, my buddies are born and raised. They have those a lot. Those don't seem to run off as far if let's say they get pressured, but, They'll, they'll kind of move around a little bit, but you can kind of get back on them um, pretty easily compared to some of the Rockies. Sometimes you, you bust them out and they're, they're long gone. So, But as far as wolves, and a lot of times wolves, maybe the elk don't leave the drainage. Maybe they just go hunker down. I've seen that before too where they're still there, but their travel gets restricted. They It's almost like they're on COVID lockdown. <laughs> um they 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 shelter in place if you will <laughs> you know they'll have a they'll, a lot of times they'll go to the very bottoms of the drainages where there's no trails no no roads and they'll get they'll get down in there in some really thick steep nasty stuff wolves don't seem to like that as much and they'll just kind of hunker down and they'll find somewhere where they don't have to travel far for food or water or cover and they'll just be quiet and they won't move and when the wolves are there, they just hunker down and then maybe the next week they kind of loosen up a little bit. You might get one to bugle in there. So if they don't get pushed out, then a lot of times they just hunker down. So, and so that's one thing I wanted to ask you about. And since you kind of like talked about the drainages and getting pushed down, you know, you heard about, you know, John and I, you know, prior to the podcast where we were at in Idaho and what we did. Um, One of the things that I think we really missed out on and we weren't very high. I think where we got into the elk was like 6,500, 7,000 feet. And I think that's why, you know, the guy that was pointing us in the direction was like, you know, it's not that high. It's not that hard. You know, it's, you know, you can manage out there 
fairly easily. Um, but we didn't, you know, one of the things I hear about with elk is like going down into these nasty drainages and stuff. And we really didn't hunt down into anything. I mean, we bugled down into each of the drainages on our way out to where we ended up finding the elk. We went down one day and found a ton of sign right along this creek. And I mean, I, it's one of those things where I, I feel like in hindsight, that might've been like a missed opportunity for us. Like, well, in a way, I mean, looking back at it though, I mean, I don't think those drainages that we were going down in were as big as, or like deep enough, like what Dirk's talking about. They were, I mean, we were easily walked down and walked back out. I mean, they were, they were steep, but they weren't like rocky. I mean, a, a wolf could easily just trot it down through there. So right. I think the territory we were in wasn't conducive of, of that. Yeah. My, my point but, is, or the, the question is, is like that type of hunting, like when, like, I guess, what are you looking for when you're looking for elk or when, when you're in an area and you're like, oh yeah, there's definitely going to be elk down there. This, you know, looks elky. Um, you know, one of the things, like I said, I feel like we missed out on was like hunting down into spots that could have been, could have been elky, but we don't have that acumen just yet. Right. So a lot of times here's kind of how I, I break up the landscape when I look at it. Uh, depending on the country I'm hunting, let's say your road system, your trail system is on top and your, your trails are on ridges and, uh, there's not a lot of trails or roads in the bottoms of these big drainages. Let's say if you walk from the road or the trail down to the, where the very bottom of the creek drainage, it's a two mile hike, maybe a thousand square, a thousand uh, foot elevation gain, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times I feel like I find the elk in that bottom one third of the canyon. That's where they kind of hang out. And so if your road systems on the top and your trail systems at the top, a lot of times I'll find those elk in that bottom one third of your, of your canyon. If you were to, to slice it into three parts, you know, it'd be that bottom third. And then in that same token, a lot of stuff I've hunted in, in Idaho and Wyoming too is like, if, if your road system, your trail system is in the bottoms, right? And there's nothing on top, um, but just jagged high elevation mountains. A lot of times, um, it's almost reverse. It's like that top two thirds is where you start getting into them. They don't really congregate as much in the bottom, more that top two thirds. So they're a little further. They kind of like to stay out of the reach, you know, a little bit. And I don't know if, um, so that's just kind of what I've kind of noticed. I don't know if that's a constant for everybody and everywhere, but, um, that, I kind of see that a lot. Would that be like a hiking trail or a four wheeler trail or, you know, yeah, four wheeler trail, hiking trail roads, uh -huh. you know, they're going to be, you know, I feel like if, if everyone's at points of access is either on the bottom, if it's on the bottom, then they're pro a lot of times they're going to be further up the mountain, you know, that two thirds of the way up uh -huh. or vice versa. Um, if all your access is up on top, then they're going to be kind of in that bottom two, bottom one third of the canyon. Sometimes in the two thirds, but or half, but most of the time, you know, a lot of times they'll be in that bottom. So, so when you find that, though, I mean, can will that be like where you'll find your rubs then and stuff like that? Your sign in, you know, that area then? Yeah, yeah. A lot of times that's where you're going to find your your rubs. Let's say you hike. Let's say you're hiking on a trail. Mm -hmm. um, horse trail and you're hiking and hiking. You're like, man, I just don't see any sign in here. And I see this a lot. Um, you'll, you'll be hiking up the bottom and every now and then you'll see like where there, there there'll be a, a major ridge that'll come down mm -hmm. and maybe it should be some timber around and maybe another ridge that goes up on the other side of the can uh, the other side of the drainage, mm -hmm. almost like this is like a funnel or a, or a crossing, if you will. Right. Sometimes you'll see some rubs right there where bull will come down, he's going to take that nice ridge, drop down, cross the draw or the, the drainage bottom where the trail is, cross, rub his horns, and then go up the other side. But a lot, sometimes if it's super steep on both sides, um, you you won't see any, any rubs or a lot of sign in, in, in that country because they're going to stay up up above. Um, and depending on noise, you know, creek noise or river noise, or if there's water down in there, Sometimes it's really hard to hear elk bugling above you. So 
um, you could you could feasibly walk up and down that thing if there's running water, a sizable creek, and you could be bugle and be like, eh, I just don't hear anything, but there could be bulls beating the band up on top of the ridge or, <laughs> or up on, you know, ter- two thirds of the way up that right. you just can't hear because right. there's so much going on. Huh. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. So, so what I want to do, what I'm trying to get out here is if I'm going to hunt a country where the access is in the bottom, I'm going to go up the bottom to where I've already scouted this on my Google earth and on, on my, on my base map to have a point of where I'm going to start climbing up, up one side of the drainage or the other. Mm-hmm. I'm going to climb up to at least halfway, halfway from the top to the bottom, and then start working my way up the drainage. Um, and then maybe I'll go all the way to the head end of it, and maybe we'll cross over and come back down the other side and make a big loop for the day, you know, make it mm-hmm. 10, 15 mile loop, depending on the country and how easy it is to navigate. Oh. Same with same with the country if you're gonna hunt from the top let's say you've got a road system or or a trail system at the top um i like that a lot better just because you can you can hear better from the top it's it's something it's still even if you don't have a lot of running water or a lot of noise down the bottom of those those uh drainage bottoms it's it's hard to hear elk up high or if it kind of benches or there's all these little terrain features up up on the on the walls of this drainage, you know, like, drainage are going to be pretty big. And if you're in the bottom, a lot of times you can't hear it or pinpoint where a bugle is. You'll hear it be like, "Where the heck was that?" Hmm. But if you're on top, a lot of times you have a, just a little better idea, or you got more of a bird's eye view and a, and a better listening position. I feel to to pinpoint things and to hear better. And so, I guess we, let's get into like you know, kind of like where you're at, but also with the, with the calling. Right. So yeah, we obviously aren't going to be able to call as well as you are. And we're definitely going to try not to be Doug. So <laughs> like, where, where is that like middle ground? And I heard you talk on, on one of the podcasts recently about, um, you know, like the different levels of elk hunter. So Frank would probably fall into the guy that decides he's going to buy a tag two weeks ahead of time and is going to go out and that just in the, in your thing, like the very most basic of, uh, elk hunter, you know, and John and I are like a half of a step above that where we've done it before. We've not had success. We've, we've called some elk, John, much better than I have. I'm more in the Doug uh, category, but <laughs> you know, how often to call, how much to call. And you talked about like slow playing and, and stuff like that. I mean, Frank is, a, you know, he used to work the shows and do, you know, Turkey calling seminars and, and stuff like that. So he's familiar with, with it from that aspect. But, you know, you talk about emotion in the calls and, you know, they don't have to be good. They just have to convey some sort of, um, you know, emotion or feeling or, or whatever. So where do guys start out from, from that perspective? I feel like if, if you want to do pretty well with calling elk, you got to start at least in June, May or June, you know, let's say you've decided you're going to hunt elk for the year immediately buy some calls and start using them, whether you're going to use the old Doug Flutie special or diaphragms of, of brand X or whoever, but you got to get those reps in. You got to figure out how to use that bugle to where every time you pull up your lips, you know what you got. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Maybe it don't sound great. You're like, eh, I don't sound like, I don't sound a hundred percent like that elk I heard on TV, but I sound kind of like that, but you know, you can make that noise over and over again mm-hmm. or the different noise, you know, the cow calls and the bugles and the chuckles and the, and the, and the challenge type bugles, you know, you can make, make those noises. They may not be perfect, but you know, you can make them and you feel confident that, okay, I'm going to make it because, but, but a lot of times, you know, folks will buy their calls. Like right now, every day, like every day I've been p- taking phone calls, guys are buying, buying elk calls and asking, Hey, I'm a new, new elk hunter. And, uh, um, I'm going to go hunting in two weeks. And, uh, what kind of calls do you recommend? <laughs> um, 
that man, that's like praying at Armageddon, right? And you're <laughs> a little too late. <laughs> you missed the bus, brother. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it can be done. Some people have a knack for it. You know, some people pick it right up. Um, but a lot of times, even if you pick it right up, you're not comfortable making all those different calls. So then that's where that whole comp level of confidence comes in. You know, mm-hmm. if you're confident in your calls, then you're going to go out and be like, okay, I'm going to make these calls and it should work. They're not the best, but you know, I've used some emotion and, and stuff. And, and I've kind of playing this, you know, I've, I've read or I've, I've watched these guys on, on, on YouTube and, and how they do it. And I, I'm doing it. I'm doing that. So I think I'm doing it right. So we just got to get enough to answer. Let's say you haven't practiced and you, you're not, good enough you don't know what's going to come out of your call right it's like all right here we go i don't <laughs> may say like a freaking chihuahua getting murdered um you're not going to have a lot of confidence in your calls and then you're going to you're going to go out and, and you're going to make those calls and you'll be like oh, man i don't know man, heck but you know it's uh, you know i haven't heard nothing it's, it's eight o'clock and it's nine o'clock in the morning i haven't heard nothing let's go back to town. but hey i got I got bacon and eggs calling my name, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> with the, you got calls that don't work or bacon and eggs. Uh, <laughs> bacon and eggs, right? Let's go have bacon and eggs. So, and then a nap in camp, and then, you know, you know the drill. Mm-hmm. But I feel like if you, if you can just know that what calls are going to come out of your calls, they don't, and, and I will say, if the more confident and the better you sound, um, a lot of times that that's the separation on public land hunting. You know, if you have a, a landscape filled with Doug Fluties that don't sound good <laughs> when they call and you sound pretty darn good. A lot of times an elk, they're not, they're like, Oh yeah, that's Doug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to answer that. <laughs> but if you sound pretty good and you're not in the typical places, people are, you know, walking up, down, up and down the same old trail or right. walking, you know, bugling from all the turnouts on the road or whatever. Um, if you're doing things different than everybody else, a lot of times, and you sound better, then you're going to get better results. Mm-hmm. Well, like I try to explain to these guys too, like turkey hunting, turkey calling. You know, I've been using turkey calls for close to 50 years, you know, and you don't have to be perfect. You know what I mean? The, you yeah. don't you don't have to have the, you know the the competition sound per se you know in the woods I've I've heard some guys with some really bad calling you know and and they've called turkeys in you know so yeah you know in, in but but what I you know what I'm he's pointing at Adam right now <laughs> <laughs> Johnny is <laughs> but but what I'm trying to explain what I'm trying to say I, mean, I guess my point is that. You know, I'm I'm building more confidence every day in you know in my calls, you know, in in, in my elk calling ability, you know, and I think I'll yeah. I think I can do all right. I I, I put enough emotion <laughs> into my stuff, don't I, guys? <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing he's flushing is emotion. <laughs> he he got the calls. You know, I ordered him uh, some of the born and raised setups and and everything and he's got the phelps mini tube that's actually my four-year-old daughter's and uh who can actually call better yeah, than she, she can call better than me <laughs> yeah. right so she's without it without a, a diaphragm too yeah <laughs> and uh but anyways i mean he's given us the beagle he's given us the duck he's given us the turkey yelps but i'll be damned if he can give us a good bugle or a cow call <laughs> oh man but so one of the things that I struggle with in is the chuckling. I just I cannot do it. I you just know? watched one of his videos today about it. So why were you doing it the way you were doing it, and why didn't you sound like him? Uh-huh. <laughs> hey, you you grab the big tube. I'll grab the big tube, and we'll have a contest, and Johnny will be the the you know arbitrator there, dude. Just saying. <laughs> I think you guys need to get on the. Is it you're the you have the elk collective, right? Dirt? Yeah, yep. yeah. And so you guys go over. I mean, every aspect of of calling, hunting from going in the woods to cutting up cutting up the elk and packing it out. Is is that how it goes? Yeah, yep, yep. Trying to 
have everything inclusive, you know, whether you're, um, maybe you're brand new, maybe you hunted for a few years and, and never tasted success, or maybe you're an old season vet and, and had a lot of success, but always looking to, you know, get better than, you know, we try to have something for everyone on there. So on there, what do you talk for these guys that want to start? I mean, if you, if you were to say like, these are the three to five sounds that you need to make, um, you know, because it can be overwhelming, you know, there's lip ball, challenge bugle, roundup bugle, you know, this mew, that mew, everything. And, you know, John could go down the list cause he's like the elk nut rain man, like just boom, 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 boom. That's what this was. That was, that. that's what this was, you know, give him that, give him this, like, geez, I don't, you know, so it, like I say, it can be overwhelming. Where would you say, like, what's your bread and butter? Where would we want to start? I think somewhere to be safe. Okay. So everybody wants to cow call. I mean, everybody needs to be able to cow call, whether that's just your jam. You don't care about bugling. There's a lot of guys, they just don't bugle on that elk hunt. They just cow call and they kill bulls. Um, but you need to be able to cow call pretty good. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I watch a lot of YouTube, uh, just like everybody these days. And man, I'll tell you what, I, I watch some guys that, man, it's like, man, that was a terrible cow call, but an elk will come into it. And, you know, it's weird to me because I'll be in the woods and I'll hear, there's a little bird. I don't know if you guys have ever heard it, but there's a bird that almost sounds like an elk. I call him an elk bird. And it almost sounds like a cow elk going, making it, it makes a little noise. But <laughs> sometimes those things, those elk birds sound more like an elk and some of these guys on YouTube that you're watching um, <laughs> and you think, well, how the heck isn't that elk fooled by that stupid bird? that sounds more like an elk than just some guy that just learned how to call or something, you know? So um, <laughs> I, I think, I think, yeah, learning how to cow call is, is, is paramount. Um, learning how to do a bugle. That's, that's, that's pretty important too. Um, chuckles and grunts, those are super hard. Let's say you just, you can't get it. That's okay. You don't have to chuckle and grunt to call in an elk. I've heard, I've had bulls, all they did was bugle and scream and bugle, and they didn't really chuckle too much. I've had other bulls, and that's all they do is chuckle and grunt. But I think what's important is try to get proficient enough to where when you, when you blow your call, you know what's going to come out. And then I like to say, play the copycat game. Let's say you just like, man, I don't know what to do. I'm still trying to figure this out. Um, the elk bugles a certain way. Try your best. Try to mimic it and, and try to copycat. Do the same exact bugle. Um, <clears throat> it's almost like the old playground, you know, and little kids mimicking each other until somebody re is ready to fight. You know, <laughs> nobody likes to be be copycatted right <laughs> so it works it works and if you're mimicking the bull you're not escalating things too quickly so you're letting things kind of build slowly it's like prom night you don't show up to the door knock on the door and french her right in front of her dad I mean, that's, not, <laughs> that's a good way to get your, your nose broke right <laughs> or something else too <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you might get kicked in, in, in the nether regions. <laughs> right. Shot with a 410. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to show up, knock on the door, compliment her dress, you know, get your corsage, have the pictures taken. You know what I mean? Same right. with elk hunting. You need to, like, slowly let – sometimes you need to let things escalate slowly. And you can tell by the bull's voice a lot of times. You can – if he's just kind of bugling half, half-heartedly, you can tell that. And then when he gets pissed off, you're like, whoa, it, it's a definitely definite change in tone. You can, you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's good. That's real good when they make that noise. So, um, playing that copycat thing, that's a, that's a, that's a game that never goes wrong most of the time. Um, uh, especially if you're like trying to get closer and closer and close the gap and getting closer to the bowl, you know, um, it, now if you're playing copycat game and he's, you know, half a mile away, he may or may not escalate things. It just may be a, Hey, I'm just bugling to an elk over here and you guys are tooting your own horns. And that's, that's the end of the story. But, 
Um, so what what would you say is a is a good distance, you know, to to get a good response like that? To where you know, how close should you try to get to them? So I want to get once I let's say I've located one. I might hear a bull off in the distance. I'm like, okay, um, I want to hear two or three bugles that are like, okay, I know right where that bull is. Um, I might even pull up my and my, I always do these days. We have all this mapping uh, software on our phones, whether you're using Base Map or Onyx or whatever it is. Um, I'm looking at my satellite imagery. I'm looking across the canyon, or maybe I. It, I'm hunting timbered country and I can't even see what's over there where that bold, that noise is coming from, Mm -hmm. but I have a pretty good general direction. You can take the little arrow on there and kind of point it right, right towards that bugle Mm -hmm. and start looking at the the topography. Mm -hmm. You can look at the, you can look at the, uh, the satellite imagery and say, Oh man, I think it sounds like he's coming from that big rock outcropping or, or that little glade over there, whatever you see across the way. And then I'll make a mark on that thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So now, it's hard some you know before we had this these fancy features um you just had okay i think it's over there you try to find you know you try to find an old snag or a rock outcropping and use some kind of a, a marker or a place mark over there to walk to but now you you do have a, a legitimate place mark so now you can bail off and walk over there it may be a quarter mile or half mile of walking once you walk around robin hood's barn to get there mm-hmm. but i want to i want to close that gap i want to get to 200 yards at least if not closer i want to get really i want to get 100 yards and any closer than that you, you do risk bumping them especially if you're if you just don't know exactly so um, yeah you want to be in that 100 to 200 yard range before you start calling again and then kind of see see where where you go from there what his heat range is then you know yeah yeah okay. yeah and i'm going to start over again you know i'm going to just give a couple, three little cow calls, some very mm-hmm. quiet ones. Because who knows? Maybe you walked right up on him and you don't even know. Yeah. So give those those couple little, two or three little quiet cow calls and, and wait and listen. You know, I might wait a couple, three minutes. And, okay, I didn't hear nothing. And I'm going to give two or three, four loud ones, you know. I'm going to wait. I really want that bull to answer my cow calls before I hit him with a bugle. And then um, once he finally answers... Sometimes they won't. I've had it happen where the first peep out of your mouth, they 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 rip a bugle. Sometimes they'll sit there for ten minutes waiting to try to get me to answer that cow call, and nothing happens. And then I bugle, and he cuts me off. So it every situation's different, but uh, but that once you've got close and you and you introduce that bugle, then you can kind of get that temperature on him and be like, oh, okay, he's he's still half-hearted, or ooh. He's mad. He, he's ready to rumble. I, I wish we would have had this conversation early in 2018. We talked to your buddy Trent Fisher, and he didn't. Uh, oh yeah. He didn't uh, tell us that. And then what John and I did is after we let that elk that we didn't that I didn't shoot at walk away, we had a pretty good idea of exactly where he was going to bed down, and we how far did we get from that bull? Oh, we were. Bedded? Within a hundred yards, I mean. Yep, and I ripped a giant bugle, and he ripped a roundup bugle, and they boogied out of there, and we were wow. right on top of them. And that, I mean, that's one thing that just haunts me. <laughs> haunts you? I was, I was <laughs> shooting, shooting at that point. That time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, one of the other things you talked about, and and this might kind of answer Frank's question also. Um, but it's one thing I wanted to talk to you about is I've heard you talk multiple times about, uh, getting on that elk's level when we're, we're turkey hunting and we're listening or whatever. We're not usually looking at elevation or anything like that. And, and so I've heard you talk about not making any calls until you make that move. And then you try to get more on the same level as that elk. How, you know, when people talk about, and I've, I've heard this from like the hunting public guides and stuff where you know, talking about trying to call turkeys up or down or, or whatever. Um, how does that work with, with elk as far as like, you know, calling up to them, down to them, assuming that the wind is, is good. Yeah. So I've called in elk from that climbed up, say from the bottom of the Creek, a half a mile up the hill, right to me. I've called them from 
way up the ridge it come straight down on me uh, before but uh what i what i really like is i like to try to be on the same level as them it makes it easy for them just to come side hill to me also it makes it easy for me easier for me let's say you know you have your 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 thermal winds whichever way they're blowing up or down um let's say there's a you know let's say it's a you got a nice blue sky and and you got your thermals rising and it's in the middle of the day or, or it's a afternoon and, and, and the, the, the cooler thermals haven't started dragging downhill yet. And a big cloud will goes over. <laughs> this has happened. I don't know how many times, but a big cloud will go over immediately. The ground gets cooled just a little bit, you know, and it'll, it'll cause a switch in those thermals. So let's say you had all your thermals going uphill. Now all of a sudden they're going down. So if I'm side hill of this bull, you know, if we're on side hill and the wind changes from up to down, it's okay because we're still on that same level and, and we're good. It's not going to foul things up. Now, sometimes they can get swirly and swirl around and, and, you know, that's, it's hard to, you just can't get away with that. Um, but also let's say, you know, you got good steady winds, whichever direction that bull's coming in. And all of a sudden he's, you know, he's a hundred yards, 50 yards out, what, however far out and you can hear him. And all of a sudden, instead of being on that same level as you, now he's starting to go low. He wants to get below you and get your wind or go above and get your wind. Well, if you're already on that, if you start out on that same level, it's, it's a lot easier just to dip and, you know, and kind of go low and try to outrun him to get to, to get to your spot. And a lot of times by you dipping low and, and, and going hard and making a bunch of noise that kind of gets them worked up a little bit too they'll hear that and they're like oh yeah here we go and they get they kind of escalate things sometimes or same with you're going if he tries to go above you to get your air get your wind it's a lot shorter distance to climb if you're already on that same level so i like i like to have that that same side hill level um if i can you know it, it, of course every situation is not perfect but also, I like to make it easy for them. You know, here's another thing, like kind of like turkeys. Um, they say it's it's hard to call turkeys across a creek, or even like a main gravel road, or you know, it's you just never know what's going to make them hang up. Same with elk. And some of this country, especially in Idaho, you'll get one of these great big alder patches, right? And alders are those those little deciduous type brush tree things. They kind of grow downhill at a downhill angle, and then they kind of swoop up. But there might be an acre of these things. There might be two acres of these of the, these alders, and they're almost in, impenetrable for us. Elk can go through them pretty easily. But it seems like to me, if I get a bull bugling on the other side of one of those alder patches, it'll be a stalemate. Hmm. They don't want to come across through that a lot of times to fight. Not not a lot, not very often. So I try to you know set it up to where it's like oh yeah there's a big alder patch over there mm, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna try to call that bull through that i'm gonna go below it circle around go above it i'm gonna try to you know whichever way the wind's going i'm gonna wait maybe i can hear him bugling and i'm gonna wait for him to cross over the other ridge there and then i'm gonna get through there and not try to put that obstacle between us um because sometimes it's that's you That's think the it affects, smallest little you, weird things that'll that'll hang him up. You think it affects his vision, though? I mean, because of the thickness, it will affect their vision, yeah, yeah. too, because because it's so thick in there. But once they get it, once you get into the alders, you can see, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty yards, okay, maybe even thirty. But um, they don't like to to mix it up. If they're on one side and you're on the other, they don't like to come through them that often. Huh. And when you talk about slow playing these elk or whatever, and when you're making these moves, you've located them and you're, you know, trying to get on their level, you're trying to cut that distance to that, that 200 yards. Um, like once you, once you get set up and you do those couple cow calls or whatever, what happens if you don't get a response? You know, I mean, for all the, I mean, basically, all of you YouTube guys, the ones around, you know, born and raised, the, the guys, you know, Corey Jacobson, you know, yourself, Phelps, you know, there's 
been all the things where they say they put the things on your truck to say you guys call too much you know where yeah. is where is too much calling how much are you calling and especially for a guy that say is only confident in the sounds that are coming out and not exactly what he's saying um is too much calling so there's 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 like a there's a group of type of hunters that are like yeah less is more right and those those might be the kind of guys that'll go walk out they'll leave the truck they won't bugle they'll walk for a half a mile a mile whatever however far out to their little spot where they want to bugle off into and they'll bugle once or twice and then they don't hear anything they're like well they don't want to bugle today or what whatever uh, or you know whatever kind of call they want to use, um, but I, I feel like you're missing opportunities. So as I get out of the truck, I'm going to bugle. I'm or I'm going to cow call. I'm going to do start my location routine. Um, I'm I'm not too proud to pick low hanging fruit close to the truck. Sometimes you can find them. A lot of times you can't. Sometimes it's that you got to get a mile or two away from your pickup before you ever hear a, a bugle. But I'm going to I'm going to try from the time I leave the truck and then all the way out for the whole day. So, and what I'm going to do, I'm not going to just walk along the trail, bugle in every 50 yards. What I'm going to do, it's going to be methodical. As I'm traveling on the trail, old road, ridge line, whatever it is, however I'm traversing the country, um, I'm looking into these pockets, whether I'm looking up, whether I'm looking down in the canyon, whichever, whichever the lay of the land is, um, but I want to be able to, it's almost like fishing, right? Um, when you're casting fishing lures in a trout stream, you've got some big old rocks out there in the middle of the river. You know, behind that big rock, trout like to congregate. Well, same with, same with, uh, elk hunting spots. Let's say it's a big old, it's a big steep canyon, but wow, there's a big bench down there. Well, I'm going to call into that bench. But as I'm walking along to get into the earshot of that bench, Oh, here's a draw and a little finger ridge down there I didn't see before. Well, I want to call into that little, that little draw or onto that finger ridge. So from point A to point B, I'm going to dissect the landscape and try to, try to bugle into those places to where it makes sense. I may walk 50 yards and bugle into the next little spot. I may walk a quarter of a mile before I bugle again, but I'm going to, I want, I want to make sure my calls are heard down into every bit of that canyon or up on to any part of those ridge onto that ridge line um, same as the trout stream you just don't walk up and throw your lure out behind that big rock and say well i didn't catch a fish let's go <laughs> no you not only do you cast behind that rock you cast every single spot and then you probably cast a few hundred extra times that <laughs> you didn't really need to <laughs> hey honey you're ready to leave no it's one more cast and then like an hour later you finally finish casting right mm -hmm. so um now as far as that's for locating elk now calling in elk yeah there are times you can call too much there's times that you can call too little um and if a bull's fired up if you guys have listened to a lot of elk i mean there's there's times where you get a bull going and he will call every 15 seconds i've had bulls come stomping in and they'll bugle every other step i mean they're just they're furious. They bugle a lot. Um, I've had other times where they don't. But a lot of times, once I get them coming, let's say I've got them, I've got them amped up. They're super pissed off. I, I know they're coming. You, you usually can tell. You can hear, you can tell by their voice. You can hear the brush popping and stuff. At that point, I shut up. I quiet down. I shut up. I quit talking. I might give one little last little call, but I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do it. Um, with a trick in mind. It's either I'm going to try to project my, my voice by cupping my hands, or maybe I cover my tube and point my tube a different direction. Or I may just put, I may just call from right, you know, directly at them from right where I'm standing. But then I'm going to move. I'm going to move 20, 30 yards downwind or over in a different spot to where when they walk up, they're looking where I wanted them to hear that noise come from, that call come from. But I've moved at that point, and then um, they're going to walk up and be looking, and I can take them by surprise. Okay. What happens when you, like I said, when you get to where you think they were, 
you make your calls and nothing happens. There's no response. I'm moving up. You're just keeping, time to move up. You're just yep. keeping going. And are you back on that location uh, plan or are you? Yep. Okay. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe the first place I call, maybe I only rip one or two bugles after I've done my cow call sequence, right? And then if I if I if I ever heard him, like hmm, I may not, he may not be here. He may be in the next ridge. And if it's if it's heavy timbered country, it's easy to to be one or two ridges off and not have them answer. And you cross a little draw, go up over another ridge. And then, you know, this finger ridge, and it's like, oh, bam, they answer. And then it's game on. Okay. And so one of our uh, our listeners there, he's hunting with his wife, and they've got, I think, 11 days. And they've killed elk before. I mean, he's been hunting elk since he was a, a child. He's from Michigan. But um, his thing is, is, he said, how do you kill one on the first day for your wife so you get to hunt? yourself and and i know i mean it it kind of falls into what we're doing too because we're going out in in different groups and i heard you talk about this with cody rich with you know how many guys are too many guys in a party or you know trying to kill multiple elk um i guess how do you um when you're hunting with a group of guys when you're trying to fill multiple tags how do you uh prioritize is it is it speed? Do you just, you're just looking for that elk that, that wants to play or, um, you know, is it different from when you're, you've got all season just to fill your own tag? Um, I think it's kind of the same process as far as, you know, trying to locate them. Um, I, I just gotta, I gotta find a bull that, that wants to bugle and wants to, wants to interact and wants to fight. And, Sometimes, you know, let's say you're in a target rich environment. Let's say there's quite a few up around and you hear a bull that just kind of, he just gives you kind of a moan, a lazy moan. And he's not really mad or didn't really sound good. Sometimes you'll say, eh, I'm not going to waste any time on that one. I want one that sounds kind of fired up when he bugles. So you may keep going until you find one that, that sounds like that. A lot of the landscape where here in Idaho, you just don't have a lot of elk in the landscape. So every single bugle, you have to go at it like, okay, this may be our only elk for the day or the week. So we got to go at that one and go go make something out of nothing, right? So if he gives you that moan, we're going to try to get over there close to him and then kind of slow, do that slow play. Just try to slowly escalate. You know, if he's doing a moan, I'm going to do a moan. And then back and forth slowly over a long period of time. And then maybe he'll get pissed off and, and he'll, he'll change his tone and want to come in. But, but uh, yeah, trying to kill, you know, let's say, let's say, oh, I really want to get my buddy an elk and then I can hunt for myself or my wife or whatever. Um, if that's the case, the best thing to do is leave your bow in the truck or a camp and you go all in for that other person. Or let's say you have a group of people. You have to be committed to, you want them to have success every bit as much as you want your own success, if not more. You want to put them first. You know, you have to put everything, all of your wants and needs behind. And let the only wants and needs that you need to have is I want them to fill their tag and have a good experience. So at that point, you leave your bow at the truck. You you help them through the landscape. You make it fun and and you put them as a priority over everything else. And by and if you can make it fun and put put them as a priority over your own self um that's when magic happens man that's when when good things happen that's when when they get they get an elk and then once they get there up awesome then it's your turn to hunt whether you're by yourself or maybe it's their turn to call one in for you because if you've been so selfless and acted that way until they got their elk they're going to be just the same for you Okay. And we've talked about a bunch of different states and a bus, bunch of different, uh, you know, places that you've, you've hunted when you're saying, you know, maybe in this state, maybe in this state, you know, John and I have hunted Idaho. Um, I'm headed to Colorado with Frank and then John's headed to Montana. Um, I've heard you talk about, you know, bulls say in 
you know, New Mexico or Arizona not responding to calls the same way that they do. Um, and you talked about the pressure in Colorado and things. What can we expect the differences to see between the states that we're hunting this year? Um, so, yeah, it just kind of depends on where you're going, you know. And um, Like, I've never hunted the Southwest. I've, I've never hunted down there. But I talked to a lot of guys that say, you know, and you hear a lot of people say, oh, you can't. You can't bugle in elk in Arizona. You got a cow calling in, but I know I know a lot of people firsthand that have bugled in tons of bulls in Arizona. Um, same with New Mexico. Oh yeah, you can't bugle them in. You got a cow calling them in. So, but I'm taking here, here's the thing. I'm not going to be so pig headed that that I I'm not going to go down there and, and be like, oh yeah, well I'm going to do it my own way. And I'm going to experiment. It's every time it's an experiment. I'm going to throw out different things until I find what they bite on. And then I'm going to go for it. And, and that's, that's going to be every state. So, um, so in some places in North Idaho, I, they don't answer a cow call whatsoever. They'll, they'll bugle their heads off at a bugle. They won't answer a cow call. So it just kind of depends on where you're going. And you just can't have a preconceived notion that, well, this is how it's going to be. You have to just go there and be like, I'm going to try it. It's an experiment. I'm going to try all these different things until something sticks. And then you have to, you know, be quick on the uptake and be like, okay, that bull really liked when I did this. Okay, I'm going to keep giving him that until that changes. Okay. And so, you know, like I said, we hunted Idaho, John's hunting Montana, I'm hunting Colorado. Um, what are the odds, you know, one to 10 that the we ipe whiz bang will work in montana or or colorado and for the guys that don't know who that is what that is can you let them know i think it'll i think it'll work in all of them <laughs> uh, basically that <laughs> we hype whiz bang we hype that's a little small town america north idaho where i grew up population 828 back then i think it's under 500 now but um <laughs> anyway so basically when you, you get a bull comes in and you got a stalemate you know they, they come in, they hang up, and you've got a stalemate, and you've been there for a while. You've exchanged bugles, bugles for 10, 15 minutes, and he's not budging. He's not coming. He's got a little spot. He'll bugle and rub, bugle and rub. Maybe he just maybe he just stands there and bugle. Just, he's not going to come in, and you're like, mm, I think. And then all of a sudden, he, he's not bugling as much. We've all kind of seen a scenario like this. So at that point, it's like, well, he's either going to lose. If I just, if I go quiet or if I just keep bugling at him or cow calling at him, he's going to finally get lose enough interest and he's going to walk away. Well, at that point, you might have a hard time calling him in even the next day. I mean, you might get him to answer again, but a lot of times it's, they can recognize your bugle from one day to the next and they're like, yeah, it's that guy I bugled with yesterday. He's a coward. I could never couldn't fight him. Not wasting my time. So what I do is let's say he's locked up at 60 yards and some behind some trees or some brush. And he just, he will not come at that point. I take things up a notch. I'm going to scream the biggest, nastiest, bugle maybe i'll throw some grunts in there and then i'm going to charge towards him i'm going to make sure i've got a big tree or a lot of vegetation something where he can't look and peek underneath and see my feet something he can't just simply just sidestep and look around and see me i want to you know it's going to be hard for him to to see me but i'm going to i'm going to crash and i'm going to break every every stick on my way to him uh, probably going to not have an arrow knock. I don't want to slip and fall and run one of those things through my, through my throat or leg or whatever. And <clears throat> I get up to about halfway to him. I want to go halfway. I can go halfway all the, all along. I'm looking for maybe a good spot. Maybe I don't make it halfway, but I got a spot where I can shoot. Let's say I got one good shooting lane or let's say I keep going and it's like, man, I think I'm going to be able to walk up here to this thing like 20 yards without him seeing me. I'm going all the way. I'm going all in. I go all the way up there, stop, knock an arrow, and get ready. And it doesn't work every time. 60% of the time, it works every time. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work every time, but it's worked a lot in the past to where 
now you've piqued his curiosity because, or you've just angered him that you, he's like, oh, how dare you? You know, you've, you've taken the challenge to the next level. If you watch elk and elk behavior, elk, <clears throat> both, they want to see each other. Before they fight, they like to size each other up. They get close. They parallel each other <clears throat> a lot of times. So they want to see their opponent before they just kind of go at it. So by you moving up, it's almost like, all right, this is my chest move. I'm moving up. I'm calling you. Now, now come out. And a lot of times they'll come out. And sometimes, it's, a lot of times, it's broadside. You know, get a broadside shot. But they want to see that bull that's that's coming up there. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the Wee Eye Wizbeck. And I've used it in Colorado. I've used it in Montana. I've used it in Wyoming. I've used it in Idaho. I've never hunted the Southwest, but chances are we get in a situation in Southwest, I'm going to let her rip, man. I'm going to do it. So, <laughs> uh, but you have to just – I think people sometimes get hung up on on trying to be a hunter. Like I need to be a hunter. I need to be make the right moves. Sometimes you need to just like <clears throat> let your your primordial <laughs> part of your brain take over and be like, I want to play an elk. I, you know, you know, role play as an elk. And what would an elk do? You know, a lot of times those things eventually somebody if there's a stalemate between two bulls, somebody's got to break the barrier. Might as well be you if they're not going to do it. So yeah, give it a shot because. If you don't do that, chances are he's probably going to walk out of your life and you may not ever get a chance to, to call to him again or, or call him in again. But uh, So I always go in. I err on the side of being a little little too aggressive, um, but it seems to work. A, a question I have, I've watched a lot of the, a lot of the videos, you know, where they, they can get an elk in within sometimes 20 yards. And they, they don't draw their bow. You know, they haven't drawn their bow or whatever. What, what would you say is the, the most opportune time to do that, you know, when they're coming? Um, I'm always looking. So <clears throat> depending on how much um, vegetation or trees I have, uh, let's say maybe he's going to come over a rise. As soon as I see antlers and there's not a bunch of vegetation in between him and I, as soon as I see antlers, I'm drawing my bow before his eyes will ever pop up. You can see their, you know, antler tips coming. Um, as soon as I see antlers and it looks like he's coming steady, I'm drawing my bow. Let's say I got a lot of crap in front of, I can see him coming from a ways, but I mean, I'm, I'm not afraid to draw my bow at 15, 20 yards, 10 yards. Um, if I have enough stuff to cover the movement, you know, let's say he's going to walk behind a fir tree. I'm going to pull my bow back real nice and easy and not move my body or nothing. Only thing that's going to come back is my, is my, uh, right arm to draw my bow. Then, uh, no, I'll, I'll wait till then. Um, but you have to be quiet. You can't like rip it back. Your bow has to be silent. You can't have a, a squeaky rest or a rest where your, your, your arrow makes, makes any noise on your rest. It has to be, everything's got to be quiet. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I, I watch these, uh, the guys on, on YouTube or in hunting shows or whatever. They, they don't draw their bow at the right time. And it's like, Draw your bow, draw your bow. Like <laughs> they should be drawing it maybe earlier than later. Right. Or sometimes they draw way too early. It's like don't, don't, don't draw your bow yet. Wait, 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 because there's you know there's some going to be some, be some vegetation or trees come up to where you'll be able to draw your bow then. Because um, you have to, you got to remember, it's like okay, you draw your bow too soon, <laughs> you have to hold that thing for a long time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> draw it too late, you're gonna get picked off. Right. So and it's a and. I, Listen, I think I, I think it comes with experience, you know, just being there, doing it over and over again. You start getting that kind of that, that gut feeling, like the little guy inside says, "Draw your bow, draw your bow." You know, <laughs> yeah. you don't, you just have a feeling. It's like, okay, now's the time. Right. Um, and that comes with reps. You know, everybody wants that that quick path to success, and but uh, sometimes it don't come. It, it just takes, you know, some time. You know, doing interacting with elk and seeing how they move and seeing how you move and, and how you screw up or, or whatever to, <laughs> to kind of figure to figure it out. You know, um, I've, I've screwed up way more times than I've ever done things right. <laughs> well, it seems like, you know, in, in all aspects of hunting, though, that we do whitetail or turkey here, you know, uh, you know, we talk about, you talk about maybe getting one or two opportunities a day, you know, and that's what we usually 
you know, end up with. As far as, you know, calling birds and stuff, you know. But right. uh, I would I would I would think that, you know, if I could if I could get an elk to answer me and and, and have an opportunity to get a shot once, you know, a day would be fantastic. You know? <laughs> oh, that'd be yeah, that'd be phenomenal. <laughs> right. A lot of the a lot of the public land, you know, I feel like one out of every ten bulls you hear, you might call in. So you're gonna have to hear ten bugles before you call one in. So for the new hunter, you know, you know, they go out and be like, Oh man, I heard a bugle, but I didn't call it in immediately. <sighs> this is not for me. Or, you know, they get discouraged or whatever. It's like, no, that's, that's real for even for guys that have been doing this for a really long time. You know, I may have to hear 10 different bulls bugle before I ever get one called in called. Mm-hmm. And to me, you know, a call in that's, that's a, that's a, Depending on who you talk to, you'll get a different answer of what actually a call in. To me, a call in is when he comes in within bow range and I can see him. I may or not be able to get a may or not be able to get a shot, but I've called him in and seen him. I and he's close, you know, within mm-hmm. 50, 60 yards, you know. I'm not gonna shoot fifty or sixty yards, but he's you know, within that that little very tight quarters, that's a call in to me. Mm-hmm. You, some guys say, Yeah, I I heard I called in four Just drop the call. No. Yep. We'll get it. Hey, guys. (laughs) Would you consider this a (laughs) (laughs) call-in? First-time listener. Long-time listener, first-time (laughs) caller. I don't know where I lost you, but um, right in the middle of that, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I might. It was phone quite phone. obvious. Was it my it? phone or yours or one of us? Yeah, I mean, we're sitting here with real good service, just sitting out in the thing. So I don't know. But yeah, uh, I, me too. Weird. Yeah, maybe it timed me out. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, you were just talking about what you considered a, a call in. Yeah. So yeah. So out of out of ten. 10 different bulls that you hear bugle, um, you might get one that you call in and it's got to be close. They got to, they got to come in that 50, 50, 60 yards from you. And that's, that's what a call in is. So, um, you know, kind of an up close and personal encounter. So, um, don't get discouraged if you've heard bugles for a week and haven't called one in close, you know, that it takes, it takes time. And so one of the things like, I don't want to pepper you with a hundred more questions, but one of the things that I think, especially for Frank, because I, I don't know how much he's like looked into it. And I know John and I did, uh, you know, a long time ago when we went elk hunting the last time, I'm sure John's up on it, but we're going with guys that have elk hunted before. It's going to be Frank and Ernie, his, his hunting partner, no experience. Um, you know, none of us have any experience breaking down an elk. And, you know, my buddy, he said he, he shoots his first elk and he goes over and lifts up the leg like, and he's going to gut it like a whitetail. And he learned real quickly that that's, that wasn't going to happen as a one man operation. So, you know, when we get an elk down, where do you start? Um, yeah, it's overwhelming. Every time I get one down, <laughs> I look at it and be like, wow, what have I done? <laughs> Man. Why, Why did do I, I do it here? here? <laughs> because I, I, I know I feel that same overwhelming sense of like, oh, now what do I do? I've been there a lot, been there multiple times, but um, you just got to start cutting. And, uh, and I like the gut, gutless method. Here's why. You know, you got, I got buddies that they continue to gut their elk out and they're like, well, why do you do that? I mean, you have to quarter the thing up anyway. The thing is going to be cut into quarters at some point anyhow whether you load the thing whole or not. I mean, um, <laughs> typically it's, you don't get one, uh, that you load whole. So you might as well start skinning right there. So I, what I do is I skin out one side, start at the legs, work my way up halfway up the side of the, the rib cage, cut across, hit the back, you know, all the way back to the ham and then down the other back leg. Um, because you don't really need to skin out that belly part. You know, you're not going to, 
you know, the gut area. There's no really reason to, to skin that out. So, but you're going to have to skin out the, 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 the back straps and the hams and the, the shoulders and the neck and stuff. So then you just kind of work your way up or you can start at the tail or start at the head and just cut and make a, a straight line right down the, from the, from the head to the tail and, uh, and then start peeling back the hide from there and then start cutting, you know, everything off after that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a daunting task for sure. Um, learn before you go, you got to know, learn elk anatomy. You know, there's, I would imagine there's probably some, some, uh, stuff on YouTube to watch how, how to do it. Um, this fall, we're going to, we're going to do a super extensive, uh, video on how to break down your elk, uh, for the elk collective. Um, but you know, there's, you know, know the muscular muscle uh, structure of an elk and where you need to separate, you know, the, let's say you want to cut a hind quarter off, well, you just cut it off at the hip socket or whatever, but the less cuts you have to make, the better, you know, you don't want your, your meat to be all cut to pieces. You know, but. <laughs> Hamburger in the field. <laughs> right. Right. Well, two of the guys, two of the guys are taxidermists that are going with us and they've, oh. they've killed elk before out there, you know, and, uh, I'm letting them do the shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Knock yourself out, boys. Tax nervous. They're picky on, on skinning, too. That, that oh, thing will yeah. probably be a masterpiece of skin, skinning work. <laughs> but, so, you know, last year you had some, uh, we'll call them trials and tribulations through your season. And we always ask, you know, what's your bow set up and, and, and that. But, um, it's changed a little bit from last year. So let's kind of talk about your last season and how it played out for you. So last season I started out with a, a set, a 65 pound bow PSE. And, um, and I fell and hurt my shoulder. I tore my rotator cuff and I couldn't draw a bow anymore. Um, so came home and sat around on the couch in my underwear for about four or five days and my wife finally yelled at me and told me to quit being a wimp and uh and uh i went to the pro shop and had him set up my bow with a mouth tab and he'd never done it before so we watched some youtube videos on how to do it and then kind of went from there and modified it to to where it worked and uh it's it's actually crazy simple and and very effective it's it's not as hard as it looks or sounds um, anybody can do it unless you got dentures, probably not going to do so good. <laughs> Might pull them out. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah. So then, uh, after, after a day or two, I, I knew I was like, oh yeah, elk are in trouble. I can, I can shoot this thing. You know, I could shoot a, you know, a, a six inch group very easily at 20 and 30 yards. So, um, so I went elk hunting and then, uh, you know, I, Hand out, you know, where I was able to take a bowl with a mouth tab. So, uh, but I just couldn't, you know, sit home and, and give up a September. It just, you know, they only, you only have so many in your life. And man, I didn't want to just have to sit on the sidelines or maybe just go call for other people, which is fun. But I still, I still wanted a, a chance to at bat, you know, for myself. Are you, are you still shooting with a mouth tab? No, no. Oh. I had surgery in December. Okay. And uh, had that rotator cuff fixed and then went through, I don't know, several months of uh, physical therapy. And uh, so now I can pull my, my bow back, no problem. I'm, I'm back to, I got up to 65, I dropped it back down to 60 because I want to be able to hold that, you know, at full draw for as long as I possibly can in case I get a bowl that hangs up weird or something. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, I can I can pull it pain free. had a buddy of mine back in the 90s. I, I worked in a pro shop and a, in Muskegon here, and uh, he he was a race car driver over here at one of our local tracks, and he was checking his trailer one night after the race, and uh, a guy with a a camper on the pickup truck come by, and one of the guide deals for the tie downs hit Johnny in the arm. Okay, hit him, and it really messed him up, and eventually. He lost the use of his arm, and then holy cow! Yeah, and he came to me, and 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 he he had this what they called a at the time it was a bow arm, and it was you could pull it back and cock the bow, 
and it had oh. like a release on the, you know, back on yeah. the string. But he was trying to he was trying to rig that to his bow, and, and it was just he was having an awful time. And I just uh, what read an article uh, on a target shooter that had one arm, and and used a mouth tab, you know. And oh, yeah. I, I said to him, I said, John, I said, let's, why don't we try this, you know? And he goes, there's no way I could pull my bow with my teeth, dude. You know what I'm going? Yeah, you can. <laughs> you know, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll turn it down or whatever, you know? And so we fashioned this tab for him and he's been hunting ever since that way. Cause he, 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 oh, had, wow. him, he had him to actually take his, his arm off, you know, the right, because it was just absolutely nothing, you know? He'd lost all use of it, and it, it really got to be a problem for him. But he had him he had him take it off. But this guy has been shooting this way since the 90s, and, and I've hunted with him. I hunted with him in Ohio, and he killed a, a 10-point, you know, climbs trees yeah. and stuff and everything else, you know. But this dude, this dude, I mean, he's, he's you know, once he started shooting that, I said, I said, just make sure you take care of them teeth, John, you know. <laughs> 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 but it was right there, you know, when you draw that bow, when you push it out, you know, and you're looking right, you know, right there, you know. No punching the trigger on that one, right? No, no. 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 You don't no. get target Can't panic for that, release. Dude. No. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you're uh, healed back up, what's your bow set up? What, are, what bow are you shooting now? Uh, I'm shooting the, shooting the PSE uh, uh, NXT 35, um, 60 pounds. Yeah, man, awesome bow. It's just shooting so good. Uh, it's eighty-five percent let off. Um, shooting a four hundred and fifty grain arrow, uh, three blade, uh, one hundred twenty-five grain um, G five strikers, uh, the V twos. Okay. Uh, yeah, they're they're wicked, man. What rest are you shooting? Uh, Hamsky, uh, the the Trinity, I think it's called. Yeah. Trinity Pro. Um, Mm-hmm. cool all right so uh, before we let you go one of the things i like to ask especially you know professional hunting guys and guys that do this you know all the time every day is outside of boots um you know what would be that for like so let's say our a week-long hunt or whatever when you're going just off your back what's one thing that you couldn't couldn't go without or one piece of gear that maybe we would overlook um that when you figured it out you were like i'm never going to the field without that again uh i think one thing that gets overlooked or you know maybe something that people cheap out on is just a pack a good pack um you know there's there's a lot of really good packs out there um i want a pack that will work as a day pack but i can throw more meat than my legs will carry in it on the first trip out, right? So if I want to carry out 25 pounds of meat, I can't. If I want to carry out 100 pounds of meat, I can. My, my pack will be capable. There, it won't limit uh, what how much meat I can take out. Just the only limit will be me. And uh, because I, in my early days of elk hunting, you know, we, uh, we did it all wrong. You know, we had like a little crappy uh, – Polar fleece backpack is almost like a Jan sport, you know. You, you could carry your lunch in there and some meat bags and and a tarp or your knives or whatever. But it it was no good for carrying anything heavy, even even with just a few minor items in there. You're, at the end of the day, your shoulders were tired, you know. So a good quality pack that's going to pack out a lot of meat, it's going to be comfortable to wear all day. It's not going to fatigue your shoulders, and you're going to be able to shoot in it well. So I think, you know, that was a, a big game changer for me uh, to having a good high quality pack. Okay. Yeah, I think we figured that out on our own the, <laughs> the hard way. Well, I figured it out. Adam and Adam ended up sticking it out with the the cheap. metal frame cheap one and I was like, "You know what? That thing can stay in my shelf forever." <laughs> and I ended up buying the Exo Mountain Gear pack and that was the best investment I ever made. I still use it. Yeah, all the time. My brother, he calls those old-fashioned ones. He calls them a torture device. <laughs> <laughs> Strap on the torture device and pack that meat up the hill. <laughs> oh man, well I appreciate you coming on here and and, and talking with us. You know, you probably I, I just picture 
you at the show was answering these same questions a hundred times well, every and, yeah and podcast and <laughs> and videos like i sat i was sitting working working today and i was listening to all your 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 podcast and i'm like man we're gonna ask him all the same questions. <laughs> all we have to do is to say, just go to just go to Dirk's podcast and listen to his stuff, and you don't even have to worry about ours. <laughs> well, what's what's <laughs> funny about that is I, I watched the uh, I don't know the Diary of a Bad Man or whatever where you're sitting yeah. there telling <laughs> that, and I was like, I was like, I could totally just make a podcast out of this. I would just ask a question and then I just record what he says. And then, because I mean, it's really awesome. That's why I didn't get into too much of the question about your history of hunting and stuff like that. Because, you know, the stuff that you've got on your YouTube and your podcast is really good. So, that, I mean, this is tailored, you know, directly for, you know, our listeners and the and the whitetail guys and, and everything like that. And I really appreciate um, the time. Um, but where can people follow along with everything that you're doing in the Elk Collective and, you know, all that? So, yeah, you can find, uh, like you said, my YouTube channel. It's The Bugler, uh, one word. Just uh, look it up. Or even you can, I think you can find me under Dirk Durham on YouTube. But um, And then on social media, I'm on Instagram. It's The Bugler. And also <clears throat> also on Facebook, Bugler. Um, then uh, we started this new, new elk hunting website called uh, The Elk Collective. And um, it's, it's basically uh, elk hunting... Um, education and video format, right? So not a lot of people have time to sit down and, and read a lot these days, you know, everything in this fast paced world we live in, everybody's listening to podcasts or watching, watching videos on the way to work or, or when they're at work, you know, the, when the boss is not looking, you watch a little bit of YouTube on the side <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> but uh, so it's, uh, you know, like you, we said before, it, it's everything elk hunting and, and, you know, if you want to learn how to hunt elk or maybe be a better elk hunter, you know, there, we have all these videos, these tutorial videos. There's, I think there's about 90 videos down there now. So, um, from a lot of different people. So I started this venture with, uh, Jason Phelps, um, Dan Staten and John Gabriel. And then we've also got a lot of other, uh, contributors on there. Um, you know, heck we even got Chris Rowe. He's a, he's an elk biologist. He's a wildlife biologist. And, that guy, you know, he's going to tell you to uh, to do it a different way than I do. He looks at the world of elk hunting completely different. He looks at it from a biological sense, from what he's experienced and what he's, you know, he's done in Colorado there observing elk for, for thousands of hours. So it's just, it's incredible the amount of, uh, the amount of, of different information that we have on there from different people. And that's just it, you know. We don't want it just to be my narrative. We want it we because listen, some maybe maybe people don't like it the way I you know, maybe they, they think, man, I'm really that's not for me. The way Dirk does it, that's not really for me. But this other guy, he's telling me this other thing and I like what he's saying. I'm gonna try that. Or maybe some people take a little bit of everybody's ideas and kind of formulate their own way at, way to hunt elk. There's just more than way more than one way to, to skin a cat. So Anyway, that's what that's what the Elk, Elk Collective is all about. It's a subscription-based website. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more on it, you can check it out at, at uh, theelkcollective.com and and click on the blog section. We have a whole bunch of little teaser videos of, of, uh, of some of the different speakers on there and, and uh, kind of what it's about. Awesome, awesome. Well, I think that's all we got for this evening. I, I really appreciate it, and uh, thanks. For Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. I love talking out loud.
Shut up and sit down.